Welcome uh, to uh, all of you who are watching uh, this online talk on uh, Four Beaux Arts, uh, fine, uh, the Center of Fine Arts uh, in Brussels, uh, on new European writing. And uh, to be more specific, we'll be talking uh, about Euro the European Union Prize for Literature uh, on Europe Day. This is a, a time to celebrate. Um, I'll be talking to three of uh, last year's 13 laureates, like uh, there were 13 winners. Uh, we couldn't have all of them uh, on the screen. Uh, it's not easy to talk to 13 people at the same time uh, in an hour's uh, time. So uh, our, uh, joining us today, Matthias Nawarat, uh, Lana Bastasic and uh, Irina uh, Sola. Welcome to you all. Um, we'll be announcing just a brief notice uh, this year's winners in a bit less than a week, a bit more than a week, I think it's on the 18th of, of May, so keep an eye out for uh, that as well. Uh, the European Union Prize for Literature uh, rewards most um, um, promising authors. Uh, from the European Union. So maybe uh, it'll be a good idea to have the, the three of you just introduce yourselves uh, briefly. Um, let me start with you, uh, uh, Lana. Uh, who are you? <laughs> That's an impossible question. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Lana and I'm a writer from Bosnia. Uh, and my first novel is called Catch the Rabbit. And it was awarded this uh, prize last year. Thank you. <laughs> uh, and um, I'm currently in um, writing residency in Zurich uh, Literature House. Mm -hmm. So okay. hello from Zurich. <laughs> Let's go to, uh, to Matthias now, Matthias. Uh, hi, my name is Matthias Navrat. I'm based in Berlin right now. I was born in Poland and moved to Germany when I was 10. So I write in German, actually. And uh, my uh, book that was awarded with the European uh, uh, Prize for Literature, uh, European Union Prize for Literature is this one, The Traurige Gast or The Sad Guest. And I'm happy to be here. Thanks for the invitation. Thanks for joining us. And Irene, you're the last one. Hi, my name is Irena. I'm a writer and artist from um, a little town near Barcelona. I write in Catalan and my second novel is called Cantujo y la Montaña Valla in English, When I Sing Mountains Dance. And yes, and I'm very happy to be here. Thank you. Yeah. So, and the uh, three of you uh, won this uh, prestigious prize, um, uh, last year's uh, prize to be precise. The idea is that it gives you um, ample opportunity to, uh, to travel uh, along Europe and to uh, get everyone uh, to know the books you wrote, uh, have people read them. Um, what was the experience you had last year? Because of Corona, it wasn't so obvious, of course, to do it like... Uh, um, it used to be done. Um, so Lana, did, did, did you feel you had the opportunity to, uh, to promote the book? Well, certainly, but I mean, the, you're very happy when you get the award, but then I was also really sad not to be able to meet my fellow laureates and, you know, just feel um, this award the way, the way it is when everything is working. And um, but I could definitely see, you know, uh, before and after the awards. So after the award, um, many, you know, uh, people were interested in the novel. Ma many translation deals happened. Uh, suddenly your, your name is somehow on the European literary map. Um, and this is why this, this award is um, so important. I mean, there are many, many awards, but not many really open the door. Uh, to this broader literary scene. So in this way, I could really see the difference. Okay, what was your experience, Irene? Um, actually quite similar. Um, the, the news came and um, it, was, it was great. I was very happy. Um, they called me and I was um, in lockdown. Everything felt very um, complicated. And then suddenly this like um, shining uh, news. So I was very, very happy, but at the same time, I was sad that we could not travel, that we could not yeah. meet each other, etc. But I could also absolutely see um, 
how um, like the difference that the that the price the price made in terms of translation deals, in terms of um, talks and conferences that I was invited um, into, and in terms of yeah how how many opportunities arise after. And Matthias, you can't say anything else now. You have to have the same experience. Yeah, I have pretty much the same experience. I, I guess the funny thing is that this price is not really very important in Germany itself. It's not really, um, it's not really. They don't have it on their screen somehow. But I, I found out that it is really important in in, in the other countries. So this was very important for me in, in order to get in touch with other people. And I had, for example, I had just one real life event, unfortunately, but still, uh, still one. It was in Frankfurt. But then um, I had um, several conversations with, for example, people from India or with uh, Andrew Singer from New York City. He was sitting in the 20th store in Manhattan and, he, and we were talking about literature, European literature. And so this was very, very intriguing. Um, very good experience uh, to to as as you both uh, said already to you know to, to to suddenly be on this European or even global uh, um, horizon of literature and and to be able to talk talk to people about writing and about problems also global problems it was very very good for me. Yeah. So yeah, because it's like you said, uh, uh, Matthias, it's it's a European prize. It's not a German, not a Spanish, not a uh, a uh, prize from uh, uh, Bosnia Herzegovina. So it's it's a different level you're playing at. Um, but um, brings me to an interesting point. Do the three of you experience your feel uh, regard yourselves as? European writers, does it make a difference uh, now? Are you a European writer, um, Irene? Um, I have to say that before the prize, I, I hadn't thought much about it or I wouldn't um, consider myself a European writer. Um, but a little bit, as we said, as a suddenly becoming part of this um, community of writers. And also in, in my case, um, my book, it was the first time that a Catalan novel won um, this prize and the first time that, that this happened. So this makes me feel um, like thrilled and, and very happy and part of, of the community that we were talking, that we were talking about. Mm -hmm. So, um, But it yeah. doesn't change uh, anything. You're a writer. That's it. Exclamation mark. I would say that, or at least what I normally say is that um, I'm a writer and also I'm, a, I'm an artist. So I work with in both fields. And it happens often that people ask me to, to, to specify or to decide whether I'm one thing or whether I'm the other thing. And I always try to say that um, as long as I am allowed or as I am able to write and to do whatever I want to do and, and to investigate what I want to investigate and to ask the questions I want to ask, um, it doesn't matter much to me which label um, I am given. Um, so I would say that, that um, yeah, I am an artist, I am a writer, I'm a Catalan artist and writer, and also a European artist and a writer. Does the same hold for you, Lana? Oh, yeah, um, in a way. I mean, for me, my background is really complex and I have three citizenships. It's very difficult to explain where I'm from. You're born in a country that no longer exists. Exactly. I was born in a country that no longer, I write in a language that officially no longer exists. So, um, so I'm also like Irene said, I'm kind of, you know, wary of tags, uh, but because of all these nas very nationalistic, you know, uh, policies in Serbia, in Bosnia, in Croatia, I do feel uh, more comfortable just saying that I'm a European writer because, oh. you know, my, I feel like the, the literary genes that, you know, their way into my writing are obviously, you know, belong to a broader scene than just Yugoslavia. So, you know, and we have all, you know, grown up on all these different, uh, different European writers, including great Catalan writers, like, I don't know, Marcelo Dureda, whom I love, who also inspired me in a lot of ways. So, uh, so I feel like I'm more comfortable with that tag. Um, and also because it's not just the European Union. That's what I love about this prize that, you know, Bosnia is not part of the European Union. And, and, and this prize actually looks at those forgotten 
countries of Europe in a way, you know, and saying this is Europe too, you know, this is also part of a European legacy. Um, so, so yeah, I would say that I do, I do myself see, I do see myself as that, but not only that. Yeah, uh, Matthias, would you like to say something? Well, I would maybe try to point out that being a European writer is a very paradox situation or a very difficult situation because in Europe, of course, each one of us uh, was raised in a certain language and the language um, we write in is linked to a specific kind of culture and to a specific historical narrative, for example. And once you start moving between borders, for example, as in my case, I was born in one country and then uh, grew up in another and I speak both languages and I know the differences between the historical narratives, especially between Germany and Poland, these are very, the differences are really uh, crucial. And so you are raised in a situation on a continent that uh, is uh, that shares uh, a common history but is forced to have different narratives mm -hmm. and um, so i guess for writers who deal with that and who uh, who experience this kind of you know i don't know this paradox in their own biography um, they um, necessarily are european writers and not national writers because they are somehow between and this problem, I don't, I don't think, for example, Americans have the same problem because they have all, all of them have the same language and the same narrative in a way. They have different differences, like, for example, um, regarding class or regarding uh, political um, um, ways of thinking and, and so on. But for us Europeans, it is really crucial to uh, stay in, in touch uh, across borders. And I think literature is one of the I don't know, one of the powerful ways to do that and to, you know, to create an European um, conscience, uh, which is complex uh, by nature. Yeah, and I think that's by history. Reasons, uh, sorry to interrupt you, but I think it's one of the reasons also why this uh, European Union Prize for Literature is so important that you can get uh, your stories across. Because I think even though, I mean, you do regard yourselves as European, so do I, there's still these uh, specific things you, the three of you write about um, that are, I don't know, that are uh, centered in your uh, specific culture. Uh, for example, um, yeah, um, Lana, the story you tell, uh, tell us a bit about the story so we can, you can understand what I'm trying to get at. So I wrote a, a story about uh, two friends uh, of different ethnic background in Bosnia growing up in um, wartime and after, after the civil war um, in Bosnia. One um, has a Serbian Orthodox background and the other one has a Bosnian Muslim background. So I was trying to show the differences in their experience um, growing up in in my hometown, Banja Luka, um, and also the kind of show the differences between the this uh, the role of the narrator and the role of the narrated at the same time, and also language because language is an important thing in the yeah with the three of you also not only from your biographies but uh, also the language you write in. Um, the language is that the excerpt that I was able to read in a translated version in English is uh, is about is exactly about uh, language. Literally, uh, you, you're calling the one call, a friend is calling the other, and it's in a language that she hasn't spoken for a couple of years, and it's like whoa, it's another world that opens up. Well, it's I mean, it's also what Matthias was saying when you know when you move a lot, and and this is something a lot of us has, have experienced. In you know the children of Yugoslavia in a way, uh, and then you know suddenly your language is called something else, and there's a lot of people who moved somewhere else and are slowly forgetting the language. And I wanted to explore the you know the connection between language and memories. Uh, where where are these memories stored, and how are they tied with the language with your mother tongue? And then what happens if you forget your mother tongue? Like do you reshape your memory somehow because you switch to another language? Which, can, can you ever forget your mother tongue, Irene? Do you think it's it possible to just like forget the language you were raised in 
born in the, that environment. It's interesting. It's interesting. And I, I wouldn't be able to speak for everyone, um, but I, I could say that it would be very hard for me or almost impossible. Um, that That's the language in which I think, the language in which I uh, feel, and the language that I want to use in order to, to tell stories, to build world. Yeah, but there are differences, I think. I talked to um, Alexandra Lun. I don't know whether you know her. Uh, she's a Polish writer, uh, Matthias. Uh, I, you're a European writer, but you were born in, uh, in Poland. Uh, she uh, once told me that she has a language uh, uh, for different uh, functions. I mean, she spoke to me and she told me she had a language for the heart and a language for the soul. And so there's different uh, sensitivities connected to uh, the different languages that she masters. Can, can you relate to that or is that? Um, I can totally, I can understand that and uh, because I've been traveling quite a lot also. I've met lots of different people who have this very special relationship with, with different languages. In Iceland, for example, was, was very clear. Um, people um, would use Icelandic or Danish at, at home and then um, English for, um, for another thing or like most, um, most of my friends um, had like, I don't know, parents from Peru, for example, or Ecuador. So people in a in a same table, people would use um, a very like a totally different language depending on who they were talking about or what they were uh, feeling while saying. Um, yeah, yeah. But and and for your example, Matthias, when you you could write in Polish, could you? Well, uh, I have uh, I have been writing poetry in Polish for a while. And this is really in funny for me because um, I'm not able to write prose uh, in Polish because I have a kind of you know divided biography. I, I started learning German when I was 10, but so all, all these uh, um, important steps of uh, development, like going to school, going to university, uh, becoming a politically thinking person and so on, uh, they happened uh, in the German language. So. Once um, I started uh, visiting Poland again when I was kind of 20 or something like that, and I was trying to speak to the people about politics or philosophy and so on, and they always um, they always um, regarded me as uh, as a foreigner because I was thinking in a different language and I was trying to translate German into Polish. Nowadays, I after being uh, uh, after having um, traveled through Europe, uh, through Poland again uh, for for several times and staying there and so on, I start to to begin uh, think in Polish again. But it's like really divided into different. As, as you say, as you cited this uh, Polish writer, it's the, basically the same. I can write poetry in Polish because it's uh, this language is closer to my heart, you can say, or something like that, or to my childish memory or to my childish way of thinking. But um, different um, er areas of my of my personality and of my thinking are very closely linked to the German language. And so it's really, I feel sometimes like I'm divided and I'm not one person, but two persons. And I have constantly, um, you know, uh, fi to find a way to, to get Keep them balance. together and to get them to talk to another. <laughs> yeah, can get crowded in your apartment. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, the, the interesting thing is then that uh, um, your main character, if I'm uh, correct, is a, a, a Polish um, uh, architect, is he? Uh, well, he's a writer. I mean, the, the, there is a writer who meets an architect. Yeah, yeah. yeah. OK. But as a Polish uh, person, uh, character in Germany. Um, so it's, it's, yeah, it's your experiences. Uh, in a way, I mean, I wanted to tell a story about uh, about Berlin um, and about the not only the um, contemporary city of Berlin, but also those different historical layers you find there, not only in the architecture, for example, but also in the biographies of the people who came to Berlin from different parts of the world or who were born there and who have different biographies linked to the to the history of Europe and, and the world. Nowadays, you find more and more, for example, people from Syria, refugees, uh, but also uh, many 
Turkish people, but and also Polish people. And Berlin is like uh, is a space for with very with many different small worlds for, of migrants, you know. And uh, the Polish one I know the best because uh, I go there and uh, frequently, and I meet the, those people frequently in the cafes or in the shops and so on. Uh, but there are also uh, others, and the book is uh, a little bit about uh, this this whole very complex picture of the city. Uh, this guy, this writer, meets different people, and for example, this Polish architect who is uh, uh, she's a woman, and she's about sixty or so, and she migrated from Poland after the, the during the communist era, and so it's uh, all about her biography is all about um the holocaust and then the communist era in poland and uh, and she's kind of she lost her uh, her i would say psychological and maybe even spiritual roots in a way so something what happened with many people in in europe and so it's a link between today and yesterday and uh, it's uh, maybe a portrait of the city yeah. So you're writing from your experiences uh, as uh, a person living in Berlin, uh, Lana, you wrote about your hometown, and Irene, it, it would be interesting to hear from you whether it matters uh, where you are uh, to write a story. Do you do you base your characters on uh, people you see when you go outside? Like Matthias just said, he, he talks to these Polish uh, uh, people who are there, he eats with them, talks to them. Does it, does it matter to you? Could you write wherever you are? Um, yes, I mean, I wrote um, the novel from London, where I was, where I was living at the moment. Um, I did this novel settled in the in the Catalan Pyrenees, just very near um, to the frontier with with France. However, I travel there very, very often. I would say at least once every two months, and I try to like. When I when I write, I need to do. I really like to do lots of investigation, lots of asking questions, lots of meeting people and getting them to tell me stories, to tell me tales, to tell me um, anecdotes of, of the past of that place. So that's my way of working. It has to do with lots of research, also. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, do you think uh, I'll switch back to you, Lana? Do you think it's um, uh, now that your uh, novel is translated, in uh, what languages do, do you know by heart? Uh, well, now it's being translated to, to most, uh, most European languages. Uh, uh, but do you think, because it's set in this historical uh, um, uh, time, uh, your, your novel, that people, for example, just say the Netherlands or um, I don't know where, can, can relate to the story? Is it important for you to get this connection and to get a message across? Um, absolutely. I was, I mean, I was worried that perhaps there are some things that would be lost on readers who are not from the Balkans. In the translation, you mean, or the, the history as such. Exactly. I mean, just the fact that the one of the main characters, she changes her name. Her name is Muslim. And then by just taking one letter out, it becomes Christian. And, um, and this is something that to us is obvious there. And to people, I think, uh, from abroad, it's not that obvious. Uh, but I didn't really worry that much about that because I didn't want the story to be about, you know, Bosniaks and Serbs. I wanted it to be about people. And, uh, and I, I guess we always have to look for the universal and the local if we want the book to work, right? Uh, so I think that the question of identity of who you are, of how language can determine who you are, how it can mark you as different. I think this is something that pe people can relate to. And I could see, for example, how the, the Catalan readers uh, in their own way could relate to this question of being marked as wrong, different, you know, changing also changing their names into Spanish names during the dictatorship, etc. And I don't know, in, in Germany, a lot of um, the, the Balkan diaspora, <laughs> uh, a lot of people who migrated here could also relate. So I hope that uh, readers can find some universal themes there and not just local. Yeah, but I think, uh, I don't know, I'm not a writer. Um, I talk to a lot of them, but I, I don't write myself, so I don't know how the process goes. But I don't think when you're writing that you have that um, um, idea in the back of your head that you need to have this universal and local to, to sell your book. Or do you, Matthias, is this something that you have in, uh, in the back of your head when you start writing a story? 
Well, when writing something, I try to get to the to the base, you know, to the ground, just to the to the core of the things, to the core of the questions I'm I'm asking. And in order to get that, I have to base my story in a specific uh, space. At least this is uh, true for me. But I know there are writers who are, who are who don't use specific spaces. They their stories can you know uh, take place everywhere. But for me, it's very important because I think that uh, what makes the individual is that uh, it comes from a specific place, from a specific culture, and from a. So we're not you know the the ho the whole idea of universalism is that we are all the same. And this I think this holds really for you know for uh, hopes and for uh, fears and stuff like that and things that we want in life. But on the other hand, and this is a very paradox situation, everybody comes from a certain specific um, uh, area and with a specific history. And he grew up or he or she grew up with specific people and narratives. So um, this is, uh, you know, when writing, the, the both parts are very important for me. I want to show that everybody is an individual but on the other hand, and with this individual constraints come also, uh, for example, um, historical uh, conflicts and uh, discrimination and stuff like that. But on the other hand, this, there's this utopia that we are all the same. We are born all the same. And then only history made us different in a way, you know? So um, in order to get to the core of this, I need to base it in a specific place but mm -hmm. to look for something universal. So I guess this is my process. And uh, in the end, when I'm good enough, uh, people can read this and they can relate to that. Um, but this is not my concern. If people will be able to do it, then my first concern is to get to the core of it. Mm -hmm. but Irena, I think you even take it a step further and you don't consider like everyone everywhere is being universal, but you even uh, give life to plants and animals and a voice uh, in, in your story to the wind, the storm. Um, where, where did that idea come from? Um. That was a very core idea um, in the sense that I realized that in my novel, I wanted to tell a story. I wanted to settle this story in a specific place in the Pyrenees, but I wanted to tell that story from the voice and the perspective of um, everyone and everything that took place in the story or that crossed those mountains. And that meant uh, people, but also, as you said, a storm or mushrooms or animals or ghosts or um, my mythological creatures. And um, I realized that I didn't want to look at the world or I didn't want to look at this story only from a human perspective. So I started playing with all these voices. The first one that I wrote um, was the, the storm. It's funny because there is a big storm going on right now outside my, my window. You might hear oh, that under at some point. Your thing. <laughs> yes. So I feel safe. <laughs> I, yeah, and so I, I wrote, I wrote um, this chapter first, and on the one side I had a very good time, um, like becoming a, like a big storm, a big cloud, and and killing this like poor man that's like walking on these mountains, who you might think is going to be the, the main character, but no, because at the second page he is killed. And um, so on the one side I had a very good time doing that, but on the other side I realized that. Um, that that was a that was something that I could do. It was something that I was interested in doing, in like inhabiting all these voices, all these um, eyes or ways of looking at the world. And that's what I I do in the novel: try to explain um, experiences and points of view from very different places. Perspectives. Did you read each other's novels? Do you have the opportunity to, to read uh, translated uh, excerpts or? Uh... I've been able to read Lana's book. Okay. And I really liked it. I've already told her. I um, sadly hadn't, hadn't read Matthias yet, but I, I really want to, um, I would, uh, my intention is to read like um, all, the, all, the, all the laureate novels yeah. and to keep reading, um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. As Matthias? Much. Um, I, I know that Lana's book came out in German, but I haven't had the chance to read it yet. And I'm, I'm not sure about your book, uh, Irene. 
but it will be translated into German as well, right? Uh, but, yes. Yes, but it's not out yet. No, it's not out yet. Well, I, I know only the this beautiful book that uh, we were gifted with mm -hmm. uh, this, uh, with all those excerpts, with the, all, those, all those translated excerpts. This one. Um, this one, yes, yes, yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. It's very nice because uh, these are um, these are only short short fragments of mm -hmm. the books, but you get a general idea of the of the tone and of the and of the language. And so uh, this I liked really very much. Yeah. And what is your uh, general reference? I mean, uh, Lana, who is your uh, your idol? <laughs> If we talk about writers, what do you write? Is it European writers or uh, You can say it's other writers. I mean, there's. Uh... Well, I mean, I studied English, English language and literature. So my first influences came from there. And it was mostly modernists um, like James Joyce, Virginia Woolf, T.S. Eliot. Of course, it's interesting how sometimes you can't really see the influence in what you're writing, but you know that it's there, that you learn, you took a lot from there. But then there was this crazy mix between that and, you know, the Slavic tradition, uh, <laughs> you know, which is completely different, but I could kind of see both and read both and, and then take what I liked liked from uh, from each. And then when I moved to Spain, then, you know, this third <laughs> current- when Very luxurious said, position. It was just a, a, a boom. So, uh, I mean, I guess we can we can all relate to this, but I, I always try to look outside, not just to stick to, you know, what was uh, being written in my language, but try to read in, in different languages and, and find different ways. And, and do people tell you, people who read your books or read your books that they can see these different influences? Well, I mean, it, Is this the question for me or <laughs> um, answer? I mean, sometimes, ahead. sometimes, uh, sometimes they can. Sometimes there are very clear references. Uh, I like to make some references to other uh, works of literature, um, but not too much. Uh, but to me, it's more like okay, what you know, you you want to tell a story, and you think what kind of dev literary devices can I use? What is the best? point of view what is the best angle what is the best voice and then you know you can go to these different teachers and see how they did it not to copy them uh but to just maybe not make some mistakes and just to remind yourself of how it can be done yeah. matthias the books in the bookshelves on the bookshelves behind you what are they who's who wrote them <laughs> um well i have uh, i have uh, here i have the polish writers Here, the German language writers, uh, American writers, also English. Um, it's pretty much the same as, as uh, Lana already said. I, you know, you start at a certain point, and then for me, it's uh, it's not even that I, you know, I don't have the plan to to work on the American writers and then on uh, these writers, but it comes one to another you know you read something and then there is a little hint towards something and then you have already heard about this other writer and so now then you you feel okay, okay now you have to read it and then you you, you switch to to this writer and so on and so on and a cert, at a certain point i started even to to work on european literature i told myself okay you have to read it from uh, from scratch you know from um the, the, the gilgamesh and okay. uh, you know uh, Ho homer yeah. and stuff like that and uh dante um but this is only one part it's like work a little bit you know and yeah, i really like enjoy heaven. it but uh, but there is al also this other process uh, of reading something and then jumping to something else which you know one thing leads uh, to another mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Was it, Irina, with you reading a book that made you decide that you were going to be a writer or how did it happen? Um, I wouldn't say it was a specific book, but I would say that, um, yes, I felt in love with books at a very, 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 very um, early age. And I, I've been reading since then. And um, yeah, I always, I always used to like write or tell stories or like invent um, worlds or just um, tell Um, folk tales or like horror tales and um, when I was outside um, camping with friends etc so um, 
I, I knew since the very beginning that that's something that I really wanted to do. Mm -hmm. Read, write and read. Yeah. What is the, um, the nicest compliment a, a reader can give you after having read your book, Lana? Well, that's a hard question. I'm really curious what uh, Matthias and Irene will, will answer. Uh, but it, it's different, you know, it's from somebody telling me, I feel like this is somehow my story. And this is the first time that I see it in, you know, I see it as literature. Uh, and there were a lot of people who also, you know, had to flee Bosnia and, and change their names. And, and this really kind of struck a chord with me because I never thought about basing it on a real story. Um, and, uh, but th to me, like the biggest compliment um, that, you know, I will always, I will take to my grave <laughs> is uh, the one that Dubravka Ugrišić gave me, uh, a writer whom I really admire. Um, and she said, uh, I haven't read anything like this from Bosnia. Um, and I didn't know at the point if that was a good thing or a bad thing, but I thought like, that's, you know, I'm, I'm so happy to hear this, um, just to see that you can add something different to the dialogue, you know, not, not to expect too much, not to take yourself too seriously, but I added at least one sentence to the, the bigger dialogue, so, so that meant a lot. Yeah. So you both can answer too, uh, Matthias, you can go first. Well, I, I, I have... I have definitely, I have to say definitely that this is, I think this is a very good compliment to hear to if when somebody tells you I haven't read anything like that before, because I'm a little, a little bit pissed when somebody says, oh, it's like Gombrowicz or it's like Kafka. You don't want to be like someone else, you know, uh, but I had this uh, funny, uh, very often a situation with readers of my, uh, of the book uh, I wrote before the sad guest It is called something like the many deaths of our grandfather Jurek, which is, ba it's, it's a story about the, the 20th century in, in Poland and uh, about a guy who uh, lives who, who who stays alive through Second World War and then the communist uh, dictatorship and, and stuff like that. And he's it's a picaresque novel and it's full of, you know, little stories and lies and uh, anecdotes and, and uh, uh, adventures and stuff like that. And uh, people came uh, to me after the readings very often and they and they told me. I have a very interesting family history as well you could write novels about it it's and i have to start to write a novel about it and i felt like it's it's nice because i i really felt that they have been inspired by this you know mm -hmm. they have been uh their conscience has has been lifted to up uh, a little bit to a higher place and they started to imagine it in his, his uh, stories uh, themselves and to remember stories of of their family and so on and this was really nice i really liked this one also yeah because you, in a way, you give people uh, something to think about. I mean, it's, um, it, it's your goal as a writer too, I think, to make people think about stuff. Yeah, definitely, yeah. Mm. Irena, compliments. Um, for me, one of the, one of the most um, exciting and beautiful um, compliments that, um, that I can receive is when someone tells me that after um, reading my book, they felt like they wanted to write um, their own novel or that they wanted to go home and work very hard on their own projects. Like it's actual, similar or, to what Matthias just said. Yeah, and I, I really like that that compliment because that's, um, that's something that I love when it happens to me, when I read a very good novel or a novel that awakens um, me and that makes me wanna, wanna right when I go and think when I go and ask questions when I go and, and, and research so I really like that that compliment when that arrives and also I wanted to tell you that in um, just a few days ago it was San Jordi Saint George Day um, and in Catalonia that's a very a very big day a day in which people buy uh, flowers and books and um, all the book um, all the booksellers go out in the streets and, and they like sell the books and writers um, we go um, to Barcelona or to big cities too, and we spend the whole day just being around and signing books and talking to lots and lots of readers. And that's a very beautiful day in which you can um, talk and share a few minutes with 
very different readers, like young people or like my older people or people who read from a very intellectual point of view or people who read from a very um, sensitive or like emotional um, place. And it's it's a very a very intense and very beautiful day in which you, you can learn a lot of things. But, but even now during these days, you were able to go outside and have these uh, meetings with readers, a uh, concise group of people. I, I... Yes, last year it was absolutely cancelled and it was a very sad thing because it's a very special day. This year it was um, like we could do it. It was obviously a little bit different and people had to be very careful and there were like queues and like um, yeah, and masks obviously and everything was very controlled, but we could see each other again. And that was that was a good thing. Yeah, so this points out the importance of, uh, of as a writer to be able to meet uh, the readers, so you can you can talk to them, you can hear what they felt while reading. Is a, um, did you have the opportunity uh, last year, well during this year, uh, after you won the prize, Matthias, to meet any of your readers? Well, there have been a very few, you know, physical uh, uh, events. Um, mostly they were online. Yeah. And this is still, of course, it's great to have this opp opportunity. But, uh, you know, I uh, would very much like to go with you for to drink a beer after our talk uh, but I, i'm really i'm really waiting for it but it's not possible so you you know you switch off and then you are alone in your in your uh, in your room so um and i really your tie miss... again that maybe uh, gives you a bit more breathing space <laughs> yeah yeah i had i had one reading yesterday and it was uh, it was not for an audi audience but we met uh, in a in a room in um, in the uh, brecht house in in berlin and this was nice because we were sitting in one room and we were talking we were all tested and you know uh, everything was safe and then afterwards we went into the into the yard and uh, the others smoked a cigarette and we just talked and it was really Great, and also strange in a way because it's been a year or so uh, yeah. since the last uh, time. And it was, I, I mean, I'm really waiting for it. And I very much hope that this year's fair in Frankfurt, for example, will take, take place because it's uh, a little bit maybe um, comparable with uh, the day you were talking about, Irena. You know, there are many readings and you get to talk to people because, you know, Having, having wrote my book, I don't want to think about it anymore. I want to, I want to hear what the others think mm -hmm. and what, what they will tell me about their lives and, and so on. And um, for me, it's like the book is a kind of, you know, an invitation. And now you have to do something with it as a reader. And I want to talk to you about what you think. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's really important. And uh, also the f physical... Um, the physical uh, part of it is also important to be able to, you know, sit somewhere and have a drink and talk and um, to have people uh, around uh, and uh, conversations you only overhear a little bit and I really miss it. Yeah, we all do. Now, would you say meeting uh, the, up with readers um, even helps you formulate your ideas for a new story, a new book, Lana, do you does it happen to you that you talk to people and think, oh my God, this is so interesting, I should delve into it? Well, I, I don't know, for me, the, the, I think the process is a, a bit different that um, I'm quite an introvert, so <laughs> I don't really go out meeting a lot of people. For me, that's, um, it's almost scary. Uh, but I did feel uh, what Matthias was saying that I, I missed it this year. I was almost envious of, of my book that it could go <laughs> and meet and touch people <laughs> literally, <laughs> and I couldn't do it um, because it is you know you it's like writing this letter, this love letter to somebody, and you put your time into it and you you put your best self into it. And no matter what writers tell you, we all want to hear back <laughs> when we send that letter to the world, you know? And this was this year, that years, where it was very hard to hear back, but I do care about feedback. Mm -hmm. uh, I do want to hear not just, you know, critics, professors, writers, actual people, you know, with Wolf called the common reader. I want to see 
what they found in the book. And sometimes you are surprised. I don't know if it happened to you, Matthias and Irena, that people find something in your, your book that maybe you weren't even thinking about, uh, but they connected with this thing, you know, it said something to them. And this to me is beautiful, at least maybe not to give me ideas, but to remind me of why I'm doing this, you know? No. But why are you doing this, Lana? <laughs> Uh, I, that's that's the question, right? Are we all just egomaniacs who just want to <laughs> produce a lot of words? Um, I, 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 I always felt like I had this surplus of this need to communicate that, um, it, you know, I, I just wanted constantly wanted to just get things out and just keep talking. Um, and, and this, I mean, for all of us, I guess it started when I was very little, but I just, I had to kind of put things into words and then things would kind of make sense. And also felt like I, I could only, you know, understand things when I put them into words. Um, but I don't know, now it's just like, I don't really know how to do anything else. I don't really have other, another choice. Irena, I'd like to hear from you. Why, why do you write, do you know? Um, yes, I write because it's um, the thing I like the most because I, I have a very, very, very good time um, doing it. And I, I would say I write and I specifically write novels because they allow me two things that are very important for me. On the one side, they allow me to, to think, to, to learn, to ask questions. And on the other, on the other hand, they allow me to, to have a very good time, to, to enjoy and to, and to experience like everything that, is to, that, that we can do with words and language and imagination. Mm -hmm. um, so that's why I write and that's why I write now. It's so good to hear that you say, and you've said it a couple of times, that you really enjoy writing because uh, I've also talked to people who say, well, it's hard business art. writing a book, really. I'm so happy when it's over, but I think it's just a way of putting it. Uh, Matthias, do you enjoy it when you write? Do you enjoy yourselves when you're writing? Uh, not always. There is always a certain point where it, uh, where when something happens while writing, you know, you you find something new or, or uh, uh, you come to a to a new place while writing, and then I really enjoy it because then it's uh, surprising and uh, it's. Um, I learn something about uh, existence or, or uh, mankind or, or, or uh, also language. Uh, then and, I, and then I really enjoy it. But very often I have when I get up early in the morning and I know I have to work. Uh, it's really the beginning. It's always very very hard. I wanted to tell a very small anecdote because uh, it relates to to your former question. Uh, if of if meeting people. Uh, Gives you no idea. something new i had this reading once in in berlin uh, of my uh, uh, last book and then there were it was a kind of uh, romanian community uh, that met there and i stayed there after the reading with them it was in a it was in an apartment of someone um it was like a literal literal saloon or something like a literature saloon and then i stayed there and they started a, a a discussion or a fight or something like that and it was so interesting for me like how they were talking to one another they were friends they had been friends for years they have migrated from romania and uh it was so interesting and i had i had this very deep sympathy for for them and i thought it's like um this is always the moment where where it starts to work for me you know when when i start to feel okay i have to write about it because there is something mm -hmm. i don't really understand but i love you know and uh, so this episode is really is now in my book in this the sad guest it's about uh, the one of the guys of this group uh, who meets them after that after this after this um, uh, thing after this um after this uh, in, endeavor uh, and uh, he tells him a story about his life and so on and so on but the whole thing i i wrote it and then like a half a year after that i met the people who organized this uh, situation and then i told them how oh, i write i wrote about you and i i named them i i i addressed them as with a certain name and they said we, that's not our name 
uh, and then I asked them questions and I found out, okay, I invented so many things. Uh, and, then, and now I think this is reality, but they were a kind of, you know, a little bit different people uh, uh, compared to the people I, I had in my book, to the, yeah. to the, uh, to the characters. So imagination. Uh, yeah, yeah. You possible. never know what triggers this, uh, triggers this um, wish to write about something, but then it changes, of course, and uh, moves on. Yeah. Uh, we started this conversation, I mean, we're already uh, almost... Uh, have to round up, but we started with, the, of course, uh, the three of you uh, saying that you're very happy that you have won this uh, European Union Literature Prize and it opened up uh, some doors for you and uh, it brought you to another level. Um, what had, what, yeah, when you got the phone call saying, hey, you won the European Union Prize for uh, Literature, uh, what did you expect that would happen? Um, in a year's time? Did you have any expectations that did come true or others we think on them that didn't really happen? And I have to put in an effort to uh, maybe do something about it. Irena, feels like lottery. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was very surprised when I received that uh, that call. Um, Miriam called me, and um, I was very surprised also because she could speak a little bit Catalan, a little bit of Spanish. So it was a very a very fun um, phone call. Um, and I would say I didn't imagine much. As I said before, we were in the middle of one of the worst times of like coronavirus. So um, I couldn't imagine what one year time would mean or would um, yeah or would happen. But I can say that I did not imagine um, all the good things that actually happened in terms of um, translations. Um, in, in my case, the, the book has been um, like transformed into a, a play, a theater play um, that it's just on at the moment. So all these good things that I think have a lot to do with the prize, I couldn't, I couldn't imagine them. So I, even in this short uh, period of time, only a year and a lot of stuff has happened, right? Yes, exactly. Um, I, absolutely. And, and I, I, I could see, as Lana said at the very beginning, that the prize um, had lots to do with it. Okay. So, yeah. If you could pick a language, Lana, that your book would be translated in, which one would that be? Well, I mean, now I'm really happy that uh, that it's out in German because I'm actually learning German. Oh. <laughs> and uh, so it's helpful, you know, I opened the book and it was like, kind of, no, I kind of can read, but it's still really far for me. But uh, uh, I would like to see it in some, you know, non-European languages and some other languages, you know, they're so far from here. I would like to see it in Arabic mm -hmm. uh, or, you know, uh, something even like, you know, uh, Korean or something like that. I would just, Very just to be curious to see how those readers um, react to the book. Yeah. Matthias? Um, well, for me, I would like to travel to China, for example, so it would help if I had a Chinese translation. Um, because all, all those translations are always important for me uh, in terms of um, being able to communicate with people of this language. And so, uh, well, this would be great, but also any other language. My, uh, there are some translation deals uh, for my book, but I very much hope that it will be translated into uh, some more languages. And, but I'm, I'm quite... Uh, um, optimistic because uh, only one year and so many things happened and I feel like this prize is also a, a kind of a label it makes you a little bit it shows or it um, it um, I don't I don't know there is some kind of importance that comes with it and people who hear about the prize they are I think um, they are more eager to you know look into the books and to uh, learn uh, to know these uh, authors and so I I hope the same for every. Uh, single um, one of us and especially for the guys who, who are a little bit off the track like for example um, the people from uh, from smaller countries that are not very often translated into for example 
German or English or French, I, I very much hope for them that something will, you know, start. Yeah, well, there is a rotation and there's always a lot of winners a year. The next uh, batch of uh, laureates will be announced, like I said, on the 18th of May. Um, and we also have a book fair in uh, Brussels that's taking place at this very moment. And um, um, Isabelle Véry, the Belgian laureate of uh, 2013 of the European Union Prize for Literature, will be talking to um, uh, some of the winners and every evening at uh, 7 30 at book fair so there's much more publicity uh for the uh, writers of uh, books that won prizes um anyways i'd like to thank all of you the three of you uh for joining me for this talk it was very interesting um i'm really looking forward to uh, reading more uh of what you write uh, but I'll start with these three books. I've only written, uh, read excerpts now, but I'm, I'm, I'll promise you, I'll read uh, them uh, to the fullest. Uh, there's uh, Irena Sola to thank. This is a wonderful book. Um, Lana Pastasic, uh, ba that's the way to uh, pronounce it, Catch the Rabbit. And there's uh, Matthias Naura, the traurige guest, the sad guest. Thanks again. Hope to see you soon um, you, in person. Yeah, let's go for a beer. Yeah. <laughs> let's go for a beer. Bye.